Hey everybody, welcome to the last lecture video for Unit 9 and the last lecture video for the whole course. Oh, we've come so far. Um, so today we're going to talk about the last example of global change and that is changing biodiversity. Biodiversity is changing a lot in recent years. You can probably guess how. Uh, generally speaking, it's going down. Uh, if you take a look at this graph here, we've got time on the x-axis. and On the y-axis, we've got the living planet index, which is a measure of biodiversity. You can see, it, see a pretty steep decline and many scholars are saying that we're in the sixth math ex mass extinction in the history of the Earth where we're seeing such a rapid die-off and loss of many species. Um, that's what it means to go extinct, is when a species dies out. Uh, and, but if, it, if a species is in danger of becoming extinct, we refer to it as an endangered species. And often these are listed or categorized, and um, we try to protect them and prevent them from going extinct. Um, these are oftentimes species with very low populations due to a variety of reasons. Um, the tiger is at risk due to its habitat being destroyed by sea level rise, and the koala, its habitat is being destroyed by forest fires and warming climate. But these animals could also be, or species I should say, because it's not just animals, but they could be at risk due to overhunting or overfishing, human development. Maybe they're a specialist species with a limited diet or a narrow ecological tolerance, or they can only live in very specific habitats, uh, like the panda, which can only live in the bamboo forest. Um, and so that means that they, they are more likely to die. Maybe they're being outcompeted as well. Here are some examples of endangered species that you're probably familiar with. Um, the only one on here you might not recognize is uh, the whooping crane, which I've shown some pictures here, and I <laughs> just love this one. <laughs> That's what I'm imagining it sounding like. Anyway, um, the whooping crane is, is an interesting example of an endangered species because it's actually in the same food web as the Florida panther which is found in Florida, unsurprisingly. And uh, the whooping crane is eaten by the bobcat, uh, which is eaten by a Florida panther. And the Florida panther is an endangered species because it is a large apex predator that requires a lot of territory, up to eight to uh, 12,000 square miles to support a population of 240 in Florida. And that territory is oftentimes being destroyed due to human development or rising sea levels. And so that means a lower Florida panther population means a higher bobcat population, which is ultimately leading to a lower whooping crane population. So we're seeing these trophic cascades of one endangered species leading to the endangerment of another. Uh, the IUCN Red List, IUCN stands for International Union for Conservation of Nature, is one of the uh, most famous resources uh, cataloging all the endangered species, uh, research on them, and conservation efforts put in place. Uh, and if you look at the numbers they've got here, 30, over 37,000 species are threatened to go extinct. That's 28% of all assessed species. Amphibians are particularly at risk, but you can see these numbers are relatively high across all sorts of different groups of organisms. Um, but not all organisms are equally vulnerable. If a species can adapt or migrate, it's less likely to go extinct. And that's going to, whether they can adapt or migrate depends on the selective pressures of the environment. Selective pressures are forces from the environment that drive natural selection. They are pressures that select. Um, and they're, they're factors that could change the behavior or the fitness of an organism in that specific environment. Could be changes in the weather or the climate, the availability of food or other resources, the amount of territory or habitat, the availability of mates, competition, etc. All of those things can exert selective pressures. And uh, as those selective pressures are being exert exerted on populations, uh, if they can respond and adapt or migrate, they're less likely to go extinct. If they can't respond, they are much more at risk to go extinct. So what can we do to protect endangered species? Uh, well, we want to criminalize poaching. Here you can see a picture of a rhino that has been poached. The, um, it's been killed and the horn has been cut off. Um, they, they're taking the horns because many people believe they have medicinal properties, but as far as I know, they do not. Um, we can protect or create animal habitats. Uh, there's a bunch of legislation that I will, uh, will touch up on in a, on the next slide. Um, we can return the stewardship of the land to the indigenous communities, which I will mention in a bit as well. We can work on educating people about endangered species to raise awareness and raise public support. Uh, at the same time, trying to build an ecotourism industry so that way um, the poachers are no longer poaching, but they're instead serving as tour guides. Many of them are not doing this because they like killing animals, but because they have no other way to feed their family. And so providing them with an opportunity for revenue that is built around the ecotourism industry is much better. We've actually seen success with that with uh, rays in the, in the Pacific Islands. Uh, we can also relocate the threatened species or protect them with armed guards. Here's the last white rhino being protected with armed guards. Uh, I mentioned some legislation, the Endangered Species Act, 
um, which we've mentioned before, it, it protects and identifies uh, endangered species in the U.S. only, whether it's shipping, trading, poaching, harming, trapping, etc. Penalizes the offenders, protects their habitat, sets up reintroduction and breeding programs. Whereas CITES, the Convention on the International Trade of Endangered Species, regulates international trade of, uh, of exotic species. Um, so one is in the U.S. and one is international. Uh, additionally, we can, we can acknowledge the contributions of indigenous peoples uh, to stewarding the land and protecting the land. Uh, many uh, indigenous tribes all around the world have close connections to the land, understanding how the ecosystems function. And um, some quotes from this article talking about, which discusses sort of the wildness of the world, um, discusses this fact, saying that many traditional practices and indigenous peoples play a key role in preserving biodiversity. So we should consider uh, bringing their voices into the conversation um, to make sure that their knowledge is, can, can be utilized. A great, fantastic, I love this book, Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer. Uh, she's a botany professor at, I want to say, New York University. Um, but she's also of indigenous heritage, and the whole book talks about those two parts of her identity and how indigenous heritage and science come together and where they differ. It's a really, really fantastic read and touches on a lot of the things we've discussed in this class, so I would recommend it to you. Um, these changes in biodiversity that we're seeing are caused by HIPCO, and I'm not talking about hippos, I'm talking about HIPCO, habitat destruction, invasive species, population growth, pollution, climate change, and over-exploitation. We've talked about most of these, um, except for invasive species, which I'll talk about now. So habitat destruction is the first one. Uh, just to reiterate, we talked about this in Unit 2, habitat destruction is a complete loss of habitat, whereas habitat fragmentation is breaking a large habitat into smaller ones that you can see here. You know, we talked about this with island biology geography theory, the creation of patches that organisms have to move to and from. Um, this could be due to roads or other anthropogenic activities like logging or farms. Um, but just because there are patches doesn't necessarily mean the species living there will be okay with it or will be fun or not okay with it. Some of them might be okay living in a patchy environment, some of them not so much. Um, and if you look at some of these stats, uh, we've lost a lot of habitat, 1.9 million square kilometers since 2000, uh, over a million wildlife species threatened with extinction, 1.3 billion tons of food wasted a year, a trillion dollars lost to the economy. So uh, protecting the habitat itself is, is crucially important. The second, uh, the I in HIPCO, is invasive species. This is something we haven't talked about yet. These are species that are not native to an area. A great example is kudzu, which is an invasive vine that is taking over um, south of the United States. You can see it grows over everything, smothers out, outcompetes for space and light. And invasive species can thrive outside their normal habitat. Um, sometimes they're beneficial, but usually they threaten native species and disrupt the food web and the ecosystem. Uh, they're often generalist, are specialist species, uh, or sorry, are selected species that reprodu reproduce rapidly and they produce many offspring when they reproduce. Um, they can outcompete very easily. They usually can capitalize on resources that other organisms in the ecosystem are using, and they oftentimes don't have natural predators, which means that their populations can absolutely explode when they're introduced into a new ecosystem. And, and when they're introduced by, to a new ecosystem, it's almost exclusively done by humans. Uh, whether it's the exotic wildlife trade, the Burmese python is an invasive species found in the Everglades of Florida because many people were buying them as pets, and when they didn't want them, they just released them into the wild. Uh, they're not natural uh, predators there, but they've become invasive. Um, and, when, and this is part of the reason why when you enter a country, you have to declare if you're bringing any fruit or plants or animals or anything like that. They're trying to prevent invasive species. Um, additionally, to exotic trade, there's bilge or ballast water. Ships will fill their, their hull up with water to help increase the balance and the buoyancy. And when they do that, they might suck up larvae of an organism, and then they travel across the country and they empty out their ballast water, and then they're depositing those larvae. So that's how things like the green crab or zebra mussels have infiltrated the United States and become invasive. They're not native to this area. Uh, the Asian shore crab is another great example. Zebra mussels are particularly problematic um, because they uh, can actually clog pipes. So as they grow in waterways, they can grow so rapidly that they will clog up pipes and, and prevent uh, the flow of water. They also are filter feeders, cleaning the water, which sounds nice, but when you have this many, it actually reduces the amount of algae in the water that other plants can eat. Now, uh, bilge or ballast water tends to be saltwater ships, but oftentimes mussels or barnacles or things like that can ship stick to freshwater ships as well. Um, and some freshwater boats have uh, bilge water tanks too. 
Invasives are also spread through the transporting of firewood. Uh, this is the Asian longhorn beetle. You may have heard about, oh, don't bring in firewood from another forest because they might actually have beetles inside of it. And if they escape, they can decimate the forest. So they say to buy local and burn local firewood uh, to prevent the spread of invasive beetles. Additionally, um, that's kind of an example of hitchhiking, which is a a term I use to describe invasive species that hitchhike on humans to get from one place to another. One example is the white nose syndrome in bats. Um, tourists who visit caves to look at the bats have picked up this uh, fungus and they have then gone to other bat caves and whether it's on their shoes or their clothes, they've spread it there. Uh, so humans are actually in charge of or are responsible for the spreading of white nose syndrome. And a similar phenomenon is happening with the chytrid fungus in amphibians, which is absolutely wiping out uh, amphibian species worldwide. So we can do a couple of things to control invasives. We can use biocontrol, trying to bring in a predator to control the invasive species. Australia famously tried to do that with cane toads. They had an issue where they had some insect pests destroying their crops, so they brought in cane toads to eat the crops. Turns out these toads couldn't jump high enough to eat the, eat the bugs, uh, so the cane toads started eating other stuff. And they just started multiplying because it turns out, hey, they're toxic to eat a cane toad. Uh, so the Australian native predators could not eat the cane toads, so they just totally outcompeted uh, any other organism there. They're pretty well hated by the Australian people. Uh, we can also try eating the invasive species. Lionfish is an invasive species, and there's a big push to make it a delicacy to increase the demand for, for killing and eradicating them. Also increasing the education of uh, individuals so that way they're aware of the risks and uh, how invasive species can spread so that they don't, are not contributing to the problem like the people releasing their Burmese pythons. Um, and lastly, inspection as you go from one place to the next, one country to another, etc. Having your clothes and gear inspected so you're not accidentally traveling, uh, carrying something with you. Uh, the, th the first P in HIPCO is population growth. We've talked a lot about population growth and how in the last 50 years we've seen exponential growth expected to reach 21 or uh, uh, by 2100 to reach 11 billion. That's going to put a large amount of pressure on the on the world for resources in terms of land uh, and fuel, etc. for agriculture, urbanization, mining, deforestation, all of those things are going to threaten biodiversity. Additionally, pollution. We just spent two units talking about air, land, and sea pollution. All of those things uh, can, can damage ecosystems while also uh, killing animals and decreasing biodiversity. Climate change as well, we've talked about that a lot. Changes in temperature, participation, or precipitation, and sea level can reduce the amount of available habitat for organisms. Uh, and overexploitation, which is uh, basically a violation of the tragedy of the commons. Here's a picture of uh, settlers in the western United States in the 1800s with all the buffalo skulls that they've killed. Um, that's why buffalo are endangered today. Um, and so uh, taking more than we need, whether it's fish or buffalo, but also even in the domestication of animals for economic use, um, reduces genetic biodiversity, whether it's cows and other livestock or corn and crops, but it could also be honeybees or even pets. Um, by breeding them for certain traits, we're reducing the genetic biodiversity. Uh, here's another example of overexploitation of the cod stocks in um, New England waters. We've got time on the x-axis and the fish landings in tons, how much fish they're pulling in each year. And you can see that it steadily rises until eventually uh, there's a huge spike in, in fish uh, cod fishing, and it's almost like the carrying capacity, but, but it's not quite the same idea. But they overexploit, and the population can't bounce back. Um, and so the population crashes, and then they, they didn't learn their lesson. They tried to start fishing again, and it crashed again. And so cod is a very rare thing to be found around New England today. So what can we do to protect biodiversity? Well, we can create and manage protected habitat areas, of course. We can use habitat corridors to connect fragmented habitats. We can promote sustainable land use practices. So we talked a lot about in Unit 5, about uh, using the land in an area in sustainable ways. Uh, we can restore lost habitats, as simple as planting trees or working with conservation groups to restore habitats. Mitigating climate change, reducing pollution, those things are going to help preserve and protect biodiversity. And if you're looking for something that you can do on an individual scale, besides an, uh, volunteering for a local restoration uh, group or something like that, you can actually replace the grass on your lawn with native plants or a garden, something that will help increase the biodiversity of the area, which will then support a more biodiverse pollinators as well. Uh, so that's a really great thing that you can do uh, to, uh, on your own scale to um, increase biodiversity of the local area. All right, um, that's all I got for you for this video and for the rest of the year. Um,
bring your questions to class, and we'll talk more about these uh, biodiversity issues then. See you later.